In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is asked a question, which is the greatest commandment? He answered, love God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. Yeah. And the second is like, love your neighbor as yourself. And then again, at the Last Supper, he says the same thing, but with a twist, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples. This time, Jesus replaced your neighbor with one another. This new love that Christ commands of us goes much deeper than the Old Testament commandment he was quoting in Matthew. The people we have been commanded to love has expanded beyond our neighborhoods to include, well, everyone. And this includes people who might make this commandment a bit difficult, like that confrontational coworker who just seems impossible to get along with, or your in-laws who never treated you like a part of the family, or maybe the person you just met, who you don't even know and really need some help. You see, Jesus knew his physical time on earth was nearing an end. So in this new take on the old commandment, Jesus also made another change. The words, as yourself, became, as I have loved you. Wow, that's a tough act to follow. Christ's sacrificial life provides a clear and concrete example of real and true love. And he put this love on display on a daily basis with his disciples. He was patient with them, speaking kindly and showing great concern for their welfare. He instructed, counseled, and comforted them, prayed with them and for them. He admonished them for wrongdoing, and yet compassionately bore with their failings. And most of all, he gave his life, dying so that they, and we, might live. According to Jesus, this is how others will know that you are one of his followers, not because you have a shirt or a bumper sticker that says so, not because we announce it from a stage or a blog or a status update, but because they look at you, at how you live, the things you do and say, and they see Jesus. They see love. greatest of these is love. We're going to spend a few minutes there today. I encourage you to take your bullet and insert out because there will be some fill-ins. Hopefully we can all learn something together. I mean, I've learned a lot just in the studies I've done. And so uh, the Lord added blessing. The greatest of these is love. Now, in the last clip, we're going to uh, talk about the, the text. Our text is the scriptures that we're talking about in that, in that clip. In the world we live in today, love, the word, has been diluted. Diluted and diluted <laughs> in two ways. Uh, when the Bible talks about love, there are four different meanings for the word love. The first one is agape. Agape is the kind of love that God has for us. A selfless love, a giving love. Then there is phila. Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. So there is a brotherly love that the scripture talks about. Also talks about storge, which is talking about family love. And then, uh, you know, like the uh, the movie uh, Grumpy Old Men, uh, you know, you don't think of them too much as a loving family, but there was a companionship there. That's the idea. And then there's eros or eros, which is a physical desire, more of a sexual love. So we're going to be talking about agape love this morning, the kind of love that we should have for someone else. Now, the Old Testament talks a lot about God's wrath. And Jesus came to talk about God's love, and he showed us what that love is like. But let's look at the scripture together. 
Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. It's in your bulletin insert, and I guess we have right up there. You're familiar with the old written law, love your friend. And its unwritten companion, hate your enemy. I'm challenging that. I'm telling you to love your enemies. Let them bring out the best in you, not the worst. When someone gives you a hard time, respond with the energies of, energies of prayer, for then you are working out of your true selves, your God-created selves. This is what God does. He gives his best, the sun to warm and the rain to nourish to everyone, regardless, the good and the bad, the nice and the nasty. If all you do is love the lovable, do you expect a bonus? Anybody can do that. If you simply say hello to those who greet you, do you expect a medal? Any run-of-the-mill sinner does that. And then on to John chapter 13, verse 34. Let me give you a new command. Love one another. In the same way I have loved you, love one another. This is how everyone will recognize that you are my disciples when they see the love you have for each other. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Lord, we pray that you take the scripture and these thoughts this morning and that these thoughts would be your thoughts and that we would take these into our hearts and use them to be a more effective Christian for you. In your name we ask. Amen. Let me see. There, okay, get caught up here. As humans, our emotions can widely vary throughout a whole range of subjects. And while it's certainly true that Valentine's Day is today, I want to focus on love. We are capable of several kinds of love, as we explained, and each type has its own intensity. There's an old saying concerning love. If you love something, let it go. If it never returns, it was never yours anyway. If it does return, it will be yours forever. And then the cynic and sarcastic footnote says, if it returns and eats you out of house and home and leaves a mess, you are either married or a parent of a teenager. <laughs> Those things happen too. We're going to talk about five different kinds of love from both a worldly and a godly perspective. And in your bullet, the uh, insert fill in, the love between a parent and a child. Now this is kind of the first one that we, we uh, grow up with, the love of a parent and a child. One young boy said love was when his daddy read him a bedtime story. He went on to say that true love is when daddy didn't skip any pages. <laughs> well, I've tried to get away with that with my grandkiddos. Uh, and skip the pages. And, oh, Grandpa, you missed something here. You know They want to hear the story, but they know the story better than I do. So uh, I, I will admit that I don't skip as many pages, but I do editorialize along the way. So uh, that's sometimes good. Mommy thinks sometimes that's bad. Anyway, a pastor uh, had a son in high school, and the son had a habit of parking his vehicle in the driveway and then coming in the house. And the pastor would go to leave the house, and there's this truck in the way. Of course, the keys are not in the truck. And, you know, pastors, uh, a lot of times, dads, just in a hurry. And they, they, they just had time and time and time uh, that they had this. And sure enough, pastor was in a hurry. He was about ready to head out the door, and he hit the door, and the son parked his truck there and was walking in. And the pastor just, he, he just went off. He just... You know, uh, as they used to say down south, he told them how the cow ate the cabbage. He, he just what? went went after it. And so he said, put that truck out in the street and right now. And so he started back in the house to cool down, and but he didn't hear the truck start, and here his son was following him in. And he said, I, I, I told you to move the truck. And he says, can we get to the end? And I said, well, what are you talking about, can we get to the end? He said, can we get to the end where you say, I love you, son, so let's try and correct this, okay? <laughs> Dad was properly shamed, repeated it, the son went and moved the vehicle, and they had a moment there, the son never parked his truck in the driveway again, 
to block his father. All of us can remember a time when as fathers or mothers we weren't patient enough with our little ones. Gives us a new appreciation how that God continues to be patient with us day after day, time after time. In a world, in this world, a parent loves their child and children love their parent, but for those of you that have raised children, there are times when that very sweet little child can make you go out of your ever loving mind. We've all been there. We've all experienced that. <laughs> Jesus, in Matthew chapter 18, verse 2, said, He called a little child and had him stand among them. And he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus was saying that a child, their heart is absolutely pure most of the time, and that they don't have unloving feelings toward anyone. The essence of God, to put it mildly. And notice Jesus didn't say we needed to be like them. He said we needed to change to be like them. All of us have a long way to go. There's another passage that talks how that Jesus dealt with children. Matthew chapter 19. And uh, you know the story. The little children were brought to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Now, that's in chapter 19. In chapter 18, verse 6, Jesus had said that a person that hinders a child or causes a child to sin, um, that it would be better if a millstone were hung around his neck and cast into the sea. Now, a millstone at that time weighed about 500 pounds. So the physical picture of tying a stone that weighed 500 pounds around your neck and throwing you into the sea had some serious consequences. And Jesus said, I'm serious about this. The children are, the, the attitude of children is what makes up the kingdom of heaven. Now I know the disciples were trying to protect Jesus from, from the hordes and all of that. I'm sure the, Jesus doesn't have time for you. Jesus is an important guy. Run along, run along. Nothing to see here. Jesus said, no, 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 no. Now, what's interesting to me is from the other side, the, the children wanted to come to Jesus. Normally, young children are afraid of an adult that they're not familiar with. They felt very comfortable around Jesus. There's no one more protective than a mama of little kids. But mamas felt comfortable with their children around Jesus. Jesus handled children with love and with kindness, not harshness. There's another kind of love. And let me catch up here. There we go. The love of self. Now, there comes a point in our, time, in our lives when we recognize that you know, what's going on and, and, and uh, there, there's, there's a point psychologists deal with it. But the love of self, self-preservation, that's something that we all deal with. Um, something that I've not gotten a handle on or been able to figure out, but it, it's very popular in some circles and that's the selfie. I don't know why some people think they have to take a new picture every 15 minutes. I don't care. I was okay with the last one. But we won't always want to be the center of our, universe, our own universe. In the attack on the Twin Towers, we had many examples of people, self-preservation. They were walking over people to get out of there. But yet then, we also had our brave first responders that were running toward the danger. And we did hear of stories of people that stayed behind to help their co-workers get down. What does the Bible say about this kind of love? The Bible depicts love as something that is higher than anything else. 
It depicts love as a sacrifice, something to be given away for free, something bestowed on another without concern of getting something back for ourselves. In John chapter 13, Jesus showed his love for his disciples by washing their feet. Now, not everyone sees the significance of this, but Jesus was the creator of the universe. Yet he humbled himself to wash their feet. In John chapter, 1 John uh, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 18, Jesus said, Dear children, let us not love only with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. Hebrews chapter 13 command us, commands us, keep on loving each other as brother. And if you look up the original language, the word there for loving is Philadelphia. Keep on loving each other as brothers. Love is simply doing something or feeling something for another person for no other reason than wanting the best for them. Father was sitting in a chair one night reading the paper. All of a sudden he realized it was his young daughter's birthday and he'd forgotten to get her a gift. So he rushed out to the local department store where he saw some Barbie dolls in the window. Going in, asked about the price, and the clerk said, well, the nurse Barbie is 20 bucks, the beauty queen Barbie is 30 bucks, and the divorced Barbie is $265. He said, why the difference? So, well, the divorced Barbie comes with Ken's house and his boat and his car. <laughs> Jesus gave us a new command, love our enemies and I'll bet that even includes ex-spouses. Getting back on a serious note, we can use that illustration to see how we kind of throw the word love around loosely. We've covered the love between parents and children, the love we have for ourselves. Let's talk about, for a minute, the item of the day, romantic love. We're surrounded by great love stories. You know, Jack and Rose and Titanic and Romeo and Juliet Anthony and Cleopatra. A guy purchased flowers, candy, and a Hallmark card for his girl because he cared enough to send the very best. In it, he wrote, I'd climb the highest mountain. I'd swim the deepest sea. I'd cross the burning desert for you. She read it and smiled and said, would you die for me? And he says, no, I, I have an undying love. I love them. <laughs> In the movies, we see what some people call love, and you know, I, it's nice to watch one of those movies, but it's it's a different type of love than. It, there's a difference between the love boat and everybody loves Raymond. All right, anyone that's married that's ever watched anyone loves Raymond for any amount of time can say, I remember that happened. <laughs> I can remember that situation. And although, you know, in the thing, they, they, were, they, they loved each other, they drove each other crazy. Why? Because when you're courting, the thing that looks cute to you, once you're married and in the relationship, that little cute thing becomes a quirk and it makes you nuts. I mean, that's part of life. And, you know, the reality is that individual hasn't changed. It's your attitude of that cute work. And so we have to re-examine ourselves. We have to look in to ourselves for our relationships. This is the story of Mary and Joseph. In that culture, it was normal for a young virgin to be married to a middle-aged man. Many scholars believe that was the case with Mary and Joseph. How did they relate to one another? Before the wedding, Mary tells Joseph that she's pregnant by the Holy Spirit, but she never had any relations with him. Now, guys... <laughs> How would we react if we were in that situation? Probably not as well as Joseph did. In fact, uh, he, he didn't want to make a public spectacle of her because he could have had her stoned if he would have brought her to the authorities. She would have been stoned to death. He decided to put her away quietly, but then the Holy Spirit came to Joseph and confirmed her story of what was going on. Not only did Joseph keep his promise and marry her, but when they went to Jerusalem for the census, he let Mary ride the donkey. 
Now, in the Middle East, even today, you go over there, and there'll be a man on a donkey and his wife walking behind. And you say, why is your wife not riding the donkey? And the man will say, she doesn't own a donkey. And then you come back another time, and the wife is walking in front of the man and his donkey. And why is the wife walking in front? And he'll say, and what's the punchline? Landmines. Land yeah. oh. <laughs> it's a different culture over there. <laughs> we don't have an actual scripture that says that Mary was riding the donkey. But common sense, she was great with child. It was a long journey. It was a difficult journey. Joseph was a godly man. Joseph was a caring man. And so um, tradition has it that Mary rode the donkey. Jesus had parents who were very loving and obviously raised him well. The next kind of love is the kind of love that God has for us. How much do we love other people? Would we be willing to die for someone else? Maybe for your grandkiddos? Maybe for your children if they're still young? How about somebody you're not related to? Yeah, it gets a little bit tough with that. We read of instances in, in the battlefield where soldiers will give their lives to protect. Uh, reading about the young man who threw himself on a hand grenade to protect his buddies and, and he died. And, and we, we see the soldiers coming back, many acts of bravery. Occasionally we'll see that. But Jesus was one of those people. He died for you and I to pay for our sins so that we wouldn't have to pay for our own sins. He set the standard and now if we claim to be his, he, li he expects us to live up to that standard. John 3, 16, we all know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That is the structure of Christianity. Dwight L. Moody was a renowned American preacher in the 1800s. He went to England for a group of meetings, and a young man came up to him and said, oh, boy, I've always wanted to go to America. And the young man was a minister. Moody says, well, when you come over to America, you ever make it over? Come on over. I'll let you speak at the church in Chicago, figuring he'd never see the guy. I mean, coming across the ocean is a pretty difficult thing now and expensive. It was even more so back in the 1800s. It was quite an undertaking. He figured he'd never see him again. Well, the guy called him and said, Mr. Moody, I'm in town, and I'd like to speak uh, as you invited me. Mr. Moody, well, I'm going to be out of town, but uh, you can fill the pulpit. So he came back uh, during the week, or he came back on Monday, and he said to his wife, well, how did the new guy do? <laughs> and the wife, God bless wives, said, he's very much better than you. Because he tells people that God loves sinners. And Moody got irate and angry. And he said, God hates sinners. His wife said, well, you can tell him tonight. Because he's preaching again for the sixth night in a row. <laughs> Moody did go to the church that night. He had some other business. He was a little bit late. He got to the church. The place was full. He listened to the message and figured out, well, I'll let him preach one more time and I'll send him on his way. But it was at the end of that sermon that the great and famous preacher D.L. Moody found himself with tear-filled eyes down at his own altar, on his knees, coming to know the full realm of Jesus and his love for the very first time. God loves every single person that walks and has ever walked on this planet. I praise God that he pursued us until we wised up. The fifth thing and the final thing, a love for our church. A love for our church. My son Tim had a dog whose name was Rusty. He was 15 years old. He just passed. But Rusty had spent a little bit of time with us. He was a large golden lab. And uh, in the house, Rusty was clumsy, to say the least. 
He had a habit of thing, knocking things over by running in the house and wagging his tail. I mean, that, that tail, you get whacked with that thing, you think a cop had taken a billy club and whacked you in the kneecap. And, but you know, he was a very loving and lovable dog, and for every bad quality he had, he had more good qualities. You know, Rusty's kind of like the church in this way. Every church has its faults and its problems. And some love to spend their time pointing them out. We talk about decisions that were made we didn't agree with, perhaps, or even about other people within the church that frustrate us. But despite all of her warts and all of her problems, we Christians should love our church. You want to get on the bad side of somebody, especially a young guy? Talk bad about his bride. I don't care how good you think your relationship is with the young man. Talk bad about his bride, and things will go downhill very fast. The Bible tells us the church is the bride of Christ. It belongs to him. Jesus said, I came for and I gave my life for the church. You want to get on the outside with Jesus very quickly. Start complaining at him about that church, about this church, about any church. I quickly want to remind the leaders of this church that leadership is all about responsibility and has very little to do with authority. Anytime if I were to see a church leader, and I haven't, but if I were to ever see a church leader who was overly concerned with their authority and their self-importance, I would instantly act to remove them from their position because leadership in the church is about servanthood. It may sound harsh, but everything must be done to ensure that we are servants for and not owners of the church that only belongs to Jesus Christ. Since this church belongs and fully, totally to Jesus Christ, and since we love him, we must love his church. We must love it enough to chip in and do things when things need to be done. We must love this church enough to support it in every way we can. And yes, that includes helping the local church with our honest, uh, with our time, our talent, our treasure. I think good thoughts when I drive by Ordnance Road and Ritchie Highway. There's a Wells Fargo bank there, and there's a... M&T Bank there. I spent a lot of time in those two places over the years. I have some treasure in there. A little bit, not much. I have a reputation in there. And every time I go in to make a deposit, they say, how you doing? And I say, better than I deserve. And we all laugh about it. And I got one little gal, she said, I just, I just, look forward to you coming in so I can hear you say that. I noticed her license plate, she pulled it up the other day. I was there early. And her license plate says four, number four, four, given. Christian girl. And then they asked me, do you need to tell, do we need, uh, do you need to tell, do we need to tell you your balance? And I said, no, I'm a married man, I'm not allowed to know that. And we laugh <laughs> about it, and we go on our way. I look forward to going in and joking with them, having a good time, and I think they like to see me coming. But you know, we should feel that way about our church, too. We should feel that way about our church. Our treasure is here. The investments that we have made in other lives. The difference we know that this place has made in many lives through the years. Hopefully the difference that this place has made even in our lives. If all you can do is come and be friendly and sing and say amen, you need to come. Now let me just pull up to the curb for a second, drop a quarter in the meter tell you something that is important. God created you and I for more. We were meant to change our world. If you want your church and your relationships to grow, you need to love more. If you want your church and your relationships to grow, you need to pray more. If you want your church and your relationships to grow, you need to be more. Think about that mission moment clip that, I, that we ran. Jesus got into people's lives. 
Jesus got messy, it said. I never thought about that before. But when you get into people's lives, it's going to get messy. Emotionally, physically, relationally, socially. Jesus just got in there and got messy. The creator of the universe was concerned about people, where they were, how they were. They always took time for it. Are you willing? Do you want to change your world? I submit if God's people would just pray more and act more like Jesus, we'd see great and wonderful things. All of this came about because of another love, the love God has for us and his willingness to make our lives better. It's in your bulletin as a reminder, but God is a God of many chances. His promise is that he will never leave us, he will never forsake us, he sees us not as we are, but as who we can be in Jesus Christ. And God loves you. The most important question to ask ourselves is, do we love him? Do we love him enough to give ourselves to him? Do we want God in our lives enough to surrender to him this morning? If you do, and as we sing our closing song, I want you to come right up here. If you need to pray, you need to pray, come up and pray. If you want one of us to pray with you, we're happy to pray with you. If there's somebody here today you just desperately need to get back with God, this is the time, this is the place. Let's all stand and bow our heads in a word of prayer. Lord, we pray that you take these words. We thank you for your love, your unselfish love that you've shown toward us. And we pray that each and every one of us will do what we can to share that love with others. In your name we ask. Amen. Step in the